what is it that's happening today that makes people talk about these past extinction events? What what are the worrisome trends, or what are we seeing that reminds us of the past? Um, you know, certainly, I, I think the um, the thing that that people focus on the most are the changes in biological diversity. At the rate at which we're losing species today is much, much higher than the rate at which species naturally originate. And so that means that global diversity is, is going down. Um, so the, the rate of this is very fast. And so if we continue at this same rate for a century or a few centuries, we will end up losing as much diversity as we have lost in these major mass extinction events. Um, for people who don't think about geological time on a regular basis, it's very useful to keep in mind that there have been four or five major mass extinction events in the last 500 million years. Right? So these are the kinds of things that happen once in 100 million years on average. So when we say that the changes we're experiencing today could get to the stage of, of these events, these are very, very large and very, very rare events in the history of our planet. And so that's a, a good reason to stand up and pay attention. In the past, how rapidly have these events played out? In other words, uh, some of them were like uh, 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 glaciation or warming events. One of them looks like it was an asteroid. For instance, how fast did this asteroid event play out? I mean, that must have been pretty quick. Right, right. So the, you know, the... Um... You know the the immediate effects of the asteroid impact. You know, obviously, would have played out over the the time scale of minutes to hours to to days. Um, what's hard for us still to differentiate is you know how many of the extinctions happened in those first few days or first few weeks after the extinction versus how much played out over subsequent years to decades or even centuries related to the collapse of ecosystems. Right, so. Um, the, when we're looking back 65 million years later, it's very difficult in, in nearly all cases to resolve timescales of decades or centuries or less. Um, at the end of the Permian, for example, when we make a radiometric date of, of crystals from a, a volcanic ash bed, uh, when we do very well, we have errors of plus or minus 50 or 60,000 years. And so what we end up being able to say is that all of these events appear to have occurred on timescales of less than a few tens of thousands of years. They could have occurred in days or weeks or decades or centuries, um, but we don't have the time resolution to show that that has to be the case. They, they could have happened over thousands or, or a few tens of thousands of years. Um, and so when we get to something like the end Cretaceous, the reason that we think it's so fast is a combination of the geological evidence that directly tells us it must have happened in less than a few thousand years with our understanding of how impact events work from our understanding of the basic physics of what's going to happen, that we, we know that the effects would have been felt on the time scale of, of days uh, around the globe. So... That's a lot of what we're doing is combining the direct geological observations, which give us a, a maximum time interval over which the event could have taken place, which typically is turning out to be tens of thousands of years, um, basically below our ability to resolve. And then what we do is we say, okay, well, what, what mechanisms do we have evidence for operating? And based on our understanding of the physics and chemistry of the planet, what would be the time scales of those mechanisms? So, for example, we know that geological processes tend to remove CO2, excess CO2 from the atmosphere over timescales of about 100,000 years. And so, if we're going to make the planet get very warm by adding a lot of carbon dioxide, that almost certainly has to happen on timescales less than, than 100,000 years if we want a, a sudden warming associated with ocean acidification. Uh, you can have very high atmospheric CO2 levels for much longer time intervals, um, but there are different ways of doing that, and you don't get the associated ocean acidification, for example, or undersaturation of calcium carbonate. So the, the time scale matters a lot for understanding the processes, and 
the key thing that we do with each of these events is to combine what we understand of the processes with what we what constraints we have from the data. Okay, just to be sure I'm understanding. So if if uh, if the if the CO2 rise takes longer than 100,000 or so years, you don't get the ocean acidification. Did I did I understand that correctly? That's correct. So if you add excess carbon dioxide to the atmosphere for many hundreds of thousands of years, one consequence of that is an acceleration of the amount of, of chemical weathering that's happening on land, which is delivering calcium into the oceans. And so then the calcium combines with the with the carbonate ions in the ocean, and you deposit more limestone. Uh, when you do this very quickly, you're adding carbon dioxide without adding calcium because the response time of the chemical weathering is slow. And so what happens then is that's when CO2 acts as, as an acid and it just drives down the pH of seawater. And so even though you're adding carbon, it actually ends up um, lowering the amount of carbonate ion in seawater because the protons that are released from the CO2 combining with water go and combine with the carbonate ion to produce bicarbonate. And so you have what's you know sort of not very intuitive is you're adding more carbon to the oceans, but when you do it quickly, you actually end up with less carbonate. And so that means the pH is going down. It also means that the carbonate saturation state is going down. And that's both of those affect organismal physiology. You know, the pH affects um, things like CO2 concentration internally in the organism. Carbonate saturation affects how much energy the organism has to expend to make its skeleton. And so, so both of those can, can be detrimental to marine animals. A question that is often asked is, okay, so this happened, uh, we, we had a buildup of carbon dioxide in the past, but th there were no people, of course, in the past. So, so you know, square that out for me. Okay. Um, so, yes, certainly there have been events in Earth's past where carbon dioxide levels have, have gone up or, or gone down um, due to, to perfectly natural processes. Um, some of those events, like the end Permian um, or the end Triassic, resulted in catastrophic mass extinction. Um, not all of them did. Um, the biggest ones, you know, generally are associated with the the largest extinction events. Um, so, if if um, by burning fossil fuels we you know conduct a you know, sort of a human driven experiment doing more or less the same thing. We know what some of the results will be. We understand, you know, um, with, you know, with reasonable certainty that how the climate will respond, that it'll tend to warm. We understand the chemistry of CO2 dissolving into seawater quite well, so we understand what's going to happen to ocean pH. Um, and so, uh, so I, I think that, you know, then it's a question of rate and magnitude, what the biological response is. Okay, so uh, uh, rate and magnitude, uh, how does the current uh, rate and magnitude of what humans are doing to the biosphere compare to these past events? Right. So the, the rates that we see are apparently about as high as, as some of these um, very large events in, in the geological past. Um, the magnitude will depend on how long we continue to release carbon dioxide at these rates. If we curb our CO2 emissions soon, the total magnitude will be much smaller than events like the end Permian or end Triassic. If we go on for many decades or several centuries at these kinds of rates, then um, human fossil fuel driven um, rise in CO2 will, will start to compare to the, the major events in Earth's past.